Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of Next Gen Sports TV. I'm Sean, the Communications Director here at Next Gen, and today we're going to be talking to Paul Farrell, the CEO and co-founder of Next Gen. Morning, Paul. So, Morning, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you started Next Gen? Well, it's a story that goes back quite a while. Um, in terms of uh, sporting goods, I've been in this industry professionally for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. But I guess my background, um, I am an English Australian dual national, born and bred in London, a Camden boy, grew up in North London, educated in England. My, um, my first introduction to sports was uh, fishing uh, stolen bikes out of the Grand Union Canal, which I'm sure a lot of uh, <laughs> English people are familiar with, at the yes. tender age of eight. Did you, did you find any shopping trolleys in there? Uh, well, quite a few. Well, <laughs> this was even before the days of shopping trolleys. I go back quite a way. But um, yeah, um, the weekend pastime was uh, finding old stolen bikes in the canal, bringing them home, stripping them down. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a neighbour who was a professional paddle beater and spray, mm -hmm. and I uh, used to save up my pocket money, like most English kids in my day, I had a paper <laughs> newspaper round, those were old, old enough to remember what a newspaper round is. Did you walk the paper round? I walked it, they were walked not, it. didn't oh, have an oh. e-bike, no, I didn't oh, have an e-bike, I hadn't hand. been invented then, <laughs> um, and used that paper round money to... Uh, buy various bits and pieces and, and basically rebuild the bikes and then uh, used to sell them. Mm -hmm. So you could say I started my bike, illustrious bicycle career back in the 60s. Okay. So from there, um, my professional career, um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a graduate in maths and physics, specialising in solid earth geophysics. Mm -hmm. I was involved in the uh, oil exploration, global oil exploration business for over a decade with one of the world's biggest companies. Uh, made a lot of money in that, ended up moving to Australia in the um, uh, early 1980s um, and gradually got back into cycling. Uh, ended up, uh, for those of you in Australia, uh, living on the Gold Coast in uh, Queensland, which is uh, one of the, it's probably the, one of the world's premier triathlon areas, cycling. Mm. At that time, there were two massive clubs. You didn't go directly into like just fishing stolen bicycles out of the Bondi? Uh, no, the no. <laughs> By that time, I actually had enough money to go and legitimately buy one. <laughs> okay. And um, <laughs> after the usual, back in the back in the 90s, I, I went through the usual alloy bikes. Yeah. And I was lucky enough that I had the money to go and buy a, um, a Look Graphite mm. bike. And uh, so I was a club rider, and I would emphasize the stuff. I'm not, a prof I'm not an ex-professional, I'm not even a particularly good amateur. I was a, in Australia, we rank uh, elite through to F grade. I was a reasonable B, C rider. I run a couple of race, club races, but I've never professed to be a great, a great rider or a, uh, or a wannabe pro. Uh, I came at it much more from a business point of view. After I got out of the oil business, um, I became, I think, what's affectionately known as an entrepreneur. I started and uh, built and sold several different businesses, completely unrelated to the oil industry. Uh, but my passion turned out to be bicycles. So I would, um, I spotted the move into composites in the late 90s. Uh, not only had my look, but I bought a very early OCLV, Trek, great bike, and uh, basically went from there. Okay, great. And then, and so what essentially gave you the idea for doing Next Gen? You've been doing this industry a long time now. Where did Next Gen come from? Well, Next Gen grew out of my when when I first um, back in the late nineties, I formed a company called Leggera, mm -hmm. Italian for light. My mother happens to be Italian, so I come from Italian Irish background. Leggera seemed to make sense because composite, if done correctly, is lighter than alloy and steel. Yep. And frame and wheels, etc. So we, we came up with the idea of the name Leggera, not Legera, as many English people call us. <laughs> yeah. 
And we started the uh, we started the bike company in Australia in 1999-2000, and it became very obvious to me very early on in that period, as the, as the brand was growing in the U in, in Australia initially, that we were having all the usual supply problems out of China. So I decided to move to China in 2000, and I was very mm. fortunate to um, be able to work with one of the better composite factories down in uh, Guangdong at that time, and was taken under the wing of one of the pioneers in the carbon sporting industry, um, who we, we basically uh, came up with a formula where I would help him with marketing and design and an understanding of how Western businesses thought. Yes. And he would teach me ground up everything that, that was to be known about composite design, materials, etc., etc. So it was a mm. it was a really good symbiosis, and uh, we we grew the, the brand uh, together to 2007. I was working down in his factory in Shandong, um, uh, Shenzhen, mm -hmm. it's called Sunda, um, and learning the ropes with some very big, uh, famous brands. And then back in 2007, I was headhunted to become uh, senior technical director of, um, <coughs> bless you, hope that's not COVID, um, <laughs> of a... Um, relatively new company up based up in Shaman, which mm. is, uh, for those who don't know, a uh, map of China. It's on the coast, directly opposite Taiwan, about um, an hour's flight northeast of Hong Kong, which was becoming a <coughs> major, major centre me. for oh. composites. So now, now I've transitioned from brand owner, so I'm now in charge of a factory of several hundred um, Manufacturer uh, you know, employees. Uh, we built up the R and D center there to fifty two engineers mm. over a period of about five six years. Yeah. Well, you do, you were doing that for like one brand, or you were doing it like was it a factory that's you know dealing with like lots of different? Obviously, you're probably not going to talk about what the brands were. No, we were we were doing multiple brands, um, and um, one of my roles as being a English Spanish German speaking semi German speaking. <coughs> Um, a person with, with mar certain marketing skills and now the technical knowledge was to bring in new brands to this particular company and we were very successful at that. Now, yeah, I'm not, I'm not uh, for various commercial reasons, uh, permitted to say who they were, but it was, <coughs> we ended up with the, the creme de la creme of high-end European brands that were being made at our factory because I wasn't interested in um, just following the traditional Chinese yeah. uh, copy and do a cheaper model. Mm -hmm. we, we, we were developing new technologies, using new materials, new processes that others hadn't done. We can get into the reasons why. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason I liked working at this company was that they gave me full reign to introduce a lot of technologies that uh, were starting to be developed but the sports industry hadn't really picked up on yet. Fast forwarding from that um, to the start of next gen, like what what do you think next gen is doing that's even different from when you were working in that uh, environment in China? Okay, well the whole the whole thing was a gradual process, but it comes from being sitting on both sides of the table as it were as a customer. When I had Legera, I was actively coming from Australia to sit down with a carbon factory and designers and design frames and, and negotiate pricing. Yep. And then when I transitioned to actually being on the manufacturing side and the designing side mm -hmm. and understanding what the capabilities of the factories and the materials and the, and the workers, the workforce is extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. And then understanding um, more about the culture of doing business in Asia, yeah. which was completely and utterly different to what I'd been led to believe as a, as a Westerner that everything was to do about price and that's all they cared about. Yeah. No, um, it, it began to dawn on me that there was always going to be this conflict between advancing what engineers like myself and many other people I was working with wanted to do with the technology that was available and the conflict with the major brands that were more interested in just remaining competitive. So their focus was more on just getting the best price 
and not necessarily always having the best product. And that's where the genesis of Next Gen Sports came. And it just stuck with me for many years as I watched the entire process of how major brands do business in Asia, trying to source their products for the absolute lowest possible price. But then the marketing story that is told to the general public that they read every day in magazines, websites, increasingly websites, yes. blogs, journals, seeks to, let's just say, embellish what is the real story behind the product. Yeah. And that was becoming a wider and wider gap until two years ago, um, through some discussions with colleagues, very famous designer colleagues of mine, um, we kind of decided that it was, it was just literally getting out of control. The, the, the story of what could be done, what was being done, and the story that was being told were almost completely diametrically opposed. Okay. okay, so yeah, you said there was basically a gap between sort of what's going on at the manufacturing level and, and what brands are demanding of that in terms of cost and then this big gap between like the reality of what people are saying. So Correct. next gen essentially is trying to bridge that gap. So how, how is it doing that? Well, it's doing it in, uh, in, in some very unique ways. First of all, there is the, the as the name implies, next generation. Mm -hmm. There is a whole group, especially over the last decade, and it's accelerating literally week by week. There is a whole class of new materials, new manufacturing processes coming through. Some are in their infancy, some are very well established in other industries. And I haven't really boiled down into the generic sporting industry. So it's, 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 um, it's important to emphasise that we are not a cycling company. We are a sports company yep. and we, we have experts, recognised experts with decades of experience, very well known in names within the industry for the first time all cooperating, even though many of us have known each other competitively for many years. Mm -hmm. the, the, the bike industry specifically, which I could speak about with a certain degree of authority, is actually a very tightly knit community of maybe a few dozen uh, people who are well known designing for a lot of brands. Mm -hmm. Now the very big brands obviously have an in-house engineering, um, and development, but their, their briefs are often very limited by the budgets they're given. And even though many of these um, engineers are very, very highly qualified and there's no disrespect to any of them, but they've always, most of them work under the knowledge that they have a certain budget to bring mm. a product into the market on. Yes. Which brings me to the second part of Next Gen, which was what we look very closely at the traditional. Uh, selling route that any product takes before it goes from inception to consumer. Now, most people watching this will understand that it's, the product starts off with a designer, a, a need to bring out a new model of mm -hmm. product X, whether it be a coffee cup or a brand new road racing front. Yep. So there is a designer involved. That designer is in the, in the, in the tier one companies, I'm talking about the the, the giants, the treks, the meridas of this world, they usually have in-house people that work for a salary and they, they're good at what they do and they design a frame which is probably based on the one they had before. So it's a generational improvement. They know the previous one worked, they've got sales figures, so they're going to improve it slightly and that's the way the industry works. So they have a design, they then generally bring it over to Asia, not in all cases, but generally come over to Asia, China, mainland China. We're currently in Taiwan, where I live. Yep. Um, and that product then is given to a, uh, a composite or alloy frame producer. And uh, the engineers then go to work doing the layups, materials, etc., etc. And once that product is fully uh, made, tested, certified, it then normally goes down an entire chain of different handlers, each of whom make money by doing their job. So in the worst possible case, you have a, let's say, a mid-level a mid brand. 
They will have a headquarters somewhere in America or Europe. They have country distributors or importers, often just an importer. So the frame will go, go to a country importer. That then can be on sold to a distributor. Mm -hmm. That distributor can then warehouse it and, and um, have a team of sales guys who's on sell it to a retailer. And then that retailer buys it, puts it on the floor and on sells it to a consumer. Yeah. Uh, each of those leaps involves a significant price increase in margin. Yes. All of these people have got overheads and they, they need to make money, of course, to run their businesses. But it ends up a product that costs X out of the factory in, in, in Asia to costing four, five, ten X by the time it gets onto the shop floor in a retail and yep. Mr. Consumer buys it. Yes. So we saw that as being something we could circumvent. Now there are obviously the wiggles and the chain reactions, mm -hmm. the 24 uh, sto uh, internet stores that have done something similar. They've, they've chopped out the middlemen, but they, in, they have really just become discount warehouses. You can't really find out much about the product. If you look at a, a website like Wiggle, for example, I'm just taking this as one example, you can click on any product, whether it be a tire sealant or a, uh, an inner tube or a frame, and the reviews are all positive. Everything is good. So you're really buying purely based on how much cheaper you can buy it than you can at your local bike retailer. Yes. Essentially, so, they're, 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 um, uh, having worked in online retail before, it's like you are, you are selling a product which is available through a number of channels, both traditional distribution and online. And yeah, then it's just, Often with these cases, it ends up being like either a fight to the bottom of the barrel on price. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I, I think one thing I think I could see about maybe next gen is that uh, you have control over the product, and this product is not available through these traditional websites. It's no. exclusively available through through next gen. Correct. Yeah. So the next gen model looked at this in detail and said, where, where is this going wrong in terms of both that is a designer. So let me just back up. There, there are basically two types of designer. There are the in-house paid salary guys, mm -hmm. and they're usually exclusive to the or tier one manufacturers, the big guys. Anything from tier two down generally employ what in the industry, and I refer to as the, the, the renter man mm -hmm. uh, designer. And that's yeah. not a derogatory term because I've been one for 15 years. So, we're known in the industry for certain things. My, spe my speciality is in uh, wheel rims, carbon wheel rims, um, road racing, and more recently over the last three, four years, e-bikes, but high-end e-bikes. I don't do commuter bikes. Mm -hmm. I don't do steel, you know, ride to the shop bikes. I specialize in high-end composites. So there are a number of very good freelance designers and they will get a contract to design something, but they, almost exclusively work on a fixed fee basis. So in other words, whether you're really good at what you do and you're innovative or you're pretty average at what you do, but good enough to make a living, you're gonna get paid the same, generally speaking. Now, those guys like myself, we, we remain in the shadows. We, we are not the brand. The brand, we have a saying in our companies, I own four different sports companies. We're all anonymous. We have to be. The brand is everything. The brand is bigger than we are. So when you buy brand X, you, you are made to believe that that product is designed, manufactured, made by that brand. Mm -hmm. Now, in certain cases, it is. It is. But... Unfortunately, in the majority of cases, it's not. It's made uh, by a bunch of backroom guys, people like myself, and a group of our colleagues who are um, specialists at what they do, and then we pass over that IP or that, that drawing, that set of drawings, and we're paid a, a fee. So whether that drawing goes on to sell a million units or a hundred, we get paid the same. 
And that, to me and my colleagues, always seemed to be a fairly bad way of doing business and making money. So we decided to change it. Okay. So question, I suppose, Break the mould. <laughs> we broke the mould. Literally, literally, yes, yeah, right. What we next gen have done is we've created this new way of doing what we call F factory designer or developer, factory developer, factory designer, direct to consumer. FD to C. FD to C. When you go to the website, you'll you'll see it. So, number one, we we formed a loose coalition of some. Right now, we're up to over twenty five of highly qualified within the industries they work in, very well known, very well respected people. I won't go into the names here, you can see some of them on the website. Yep. And we explained the idea and it was universally, wow, this is, this is really good, I can finally start making some money. Because what they're doing now, they have a stake in the, in the quality of what they're making and it's not price based, it's not price of manufacturing based. Because we've cut out all of the middlemen, so let's let's take an example. We're designing a new wheel. Let's call it the um, the new aero gravel wheel we've just developed and are about to release. Yeah. Um, designed by the most famous wheel designer in the world for the last 25 plus years. Uh, made in a factory that I work with in China. All the parts are top grade. We, we assemble that wheel in America. So the parts eventually will get shipped to the, the States. We have a fulfillment slash warehouse just outside Salt Lake City. The, pro the products are then uh, assembled, quality control checked, and then sent directly to the consumer. So we've cut out all the middlemen. So now the developer and the factory get a much larger margin that's based on sales. Yep. It's not based on just whether we buy a hundred or a thousand, this is the price we want. Uh, the more we sell, the more they make. So there is incentive to make a better product, demonstrably better, I would add. We can't, we do not engage in marketing. We, we haven't spent a, a cent in marketing. Mm. We don't have a marketing agency. We do direct communication to our customers. We don't believe in the glitz and hype coming out of marketing agencies. So when you say about the, the products, that these products are proven and that they work, like how, how, how do you prove that? You okay, well we, we start off, any, any new discussion with, uh, when somebody comes to us, any, anybody, and I do mean anybody, you don't need to be an engineer, you don't need to be in the sports industry, you don't need to, mm -hmm. anybody with an idea that is sports related, performance sports related in any sport, can come to us anonymously and say, look, I've got this idea, what do you think? We're not interested in your IP, we don't want to see drawings, we just have a chat about it amongst our associates. We say, that sounds like a good idea, let's find out more about it. Before we do anything, if it's a product that already exists, a category of sports products exists, we benchmark it. We will physically go out and buy a product, or we'll borrow product, and we'll exhaustively test it, because obviously we have extensive test facilities in the factories we use, so any product we can test exactly the same way as the manufacturer tests it and certifies it. So now we've got a baseline. If we then feel that we can improve on it, mm -hmm. we will take on the, take on the product. Yep. So we're not only benchmarking, but we've now got a set of data where we can compare it in all of the major criteria mm -hmm. that a consumer's interested in. Weight, stiffness, performance over certain criteria. Not hypothetical, use this and you'll swim 100 meters you know two minutes quicker or whatever it may be that's marketing jargon um, unless we can measure it record it accurately videotape it being recorded we won't promote it but if you go to our website you'll notice on basically every product there's what we call tech talk tech talk is for those consumers who are interested in the product sufficiently to delve, do a deep dive into how the product was conceived, who designed it, who was involved in it, and then all the testing data. And we'll actually show impact tests for wheels, which no company that I know does. 
and we'll, we'll show the results. Now, at any time, if a, if a, um, a competitor, for want of a better word, wants to uh, question that data, they're more than capable of doing so. We, we are a very open company. We've nothing to hide, or we wouldn't be putting this data out there. But we just feel that it's better to be honest with your customers rather than just have some marketing agency mm. making up, you know, fancy sounding headlines. So just a, a quick an uh, anecdote um, from many years ago, um, uh, back in the early to mid 2000s, uh, gentleman, American uh, general by the name of Andy Ording. Andy, if you're out there, um, hi, say uh, hi from Paul. Uh, I believe we were at a show and uh, we were having a coffee together or something and Andy, Andy just mentioned to me, he said, Paul, you do re realise that you know, with wind tunnel testing you can prove basically anything you want to claim. And that always stuck with me and um, basically it's true. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, mar look, marketing has its place, but I just think the lines are being stretched way too far now with, with claims, especially over the last few years where there are more and more and more of these very small brands trying to get their little piece of the action yeah. and just just making claims that are not that they can't be backed up they're, they're they're regarded as a bit of a joke within professionals yeah but they're out there and you know they're 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 scraping a living but i just i just feel it's kind of deception and uh, mm. should be called out okay so you mentioned something about uh, it was really interesting there you said if so if anybody out there has got an idea for uh, like a, a sporting product, they can contact Next Gen and we can have a look at it. Yeah, sure. And I mean, could it be could it be anything? Like, I mean, if I like, I've got this fantastic idea for a, a left-handed tire lever. I think that might be. A, You're in. I think You're in. There's a huge, awesome. huge, huge need for it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, why not? Uh, I'll get back to you on that one. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll, um, I should wait. No, uh, with bated breath. If you. <laughs> Look, in, in my experience, there are, there are a number of English, we call them uh, Fred in a Shed. There are an enormous amount of people out there who are closet engineers, they've got some good ideas, but they just don't know how to turn a good idea into a product which they can actually get to market, how to get to market. Um, it costs money. R&D is not cheap. And you need to know the right people who are not going to basically just steal your idea. So if you go to the Next Gen website, you'll see one of the pages under the contacts section is for uh, budding or existing or highly experienced engineers who've got an idea that they've tried to pitch maybe to a brand and didn't work, mm -hmm. but they can come to us and we as a group, because Next Gen are just like you. We are a group of loosely associated designers, developers, material scientists, manufacturing companies, all who start every day of our lives thinking of a new idea. Some of them are ridiculous. You know, some, some might sound good on paper, mm -hmm. too difficult to make, but for the genuinely good ones, we're not interested in having drawings from you or stealing your IP. We get back to you with the co collective consensus and then people whose speciality are in the areas of what you're talking about, and we can discuss it if we feel it has merit. And um, if, it, if it looks good, we, we come to a commercial arrangement and you become part of the extended next-gen sports family of mm. talented designers, developers. And, and that's how it works. Good. Sounds good. Answers on a postcard. <laughs> Answers on a postcard. So, Paul, the, um, the next-gen website is obviously going to be launching very soon. Uh, what uh, can people out there expect to see on the website when it launches? Well, um, in terms of product, as I say, uh, the, the, the website in its current form tries to, it, it's not just a sales platform. In this first iteration, we are trying to explain to people who've never heard of Next Gen Sports LLC what we are, who we are, and why we're doing what we're doing. Most websites never tell you that. It's just straight into the high glossy, you know, super smooth, super professional videos of sporting goods and people breaking records and how great they are and how many awards they've won. Mm. And it's a lot of gloss and that's how the industry generally works. Yep. So version one of the website is trying to introduce people more to the 
what's the theory of next gen, how do we operate, where the products are. But in terms of product, you'll see a number of categories. Yep. Because the uh, most of us in, at the moment, 2020, and because of the COVID, we've concentrated mostly this year on cycling, high performance cycling product. Yep. But we do have a range of other products you'll see on the website, uh, motocross, um, uh, swim, you know, uh, underwater diving, swimming, uh, kayaking. We have a range of products coming through, but right now we'll be launching with approximately 25 to maybe 30 different products. Mm. And then the idea is that we have products right now in three stages. We've got early development, um, prototyping, and um, pre-production uh, testing and, and certification. So we, we hope to have new product launches roughly every two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, starting towards the end of this year and then growing into 2021 and beyond. Great. Excuse me. <coughs> not COVID. Not, not COVID, because thankfully, where we are in Taiwan, ta the government did a fantastic job on it. That's and why there has we're been not wearing masks, but... Um, zero, zero coronavirus cases. I strongly suggest everybody spread. wear a mask and social distance. Yep. Just don't Six feet. do the interview in a dusty... <laughs> in a du with a dusty table that makes a sneeze and cough. All right, great, Paul. Um, thanks for your time today. It's been really no, interesting. No, thank you, Sean. And uh, th this will be um, this will be something we'll be doing on a regular basis, and we'll be introducing some of our associates, some very famous people, uh, either live or via Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Meetings. Yep. So there will be this will continue. So welcome to Next Gen Sports and Next Gen Sports uh, TV. Thanks uh, very much for listening. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, if you want to know more about Next Gen Sports, then you can visit our website, nextgensports.com. Okay, thanks guys. See you next time.